So my name is Sam. Uh, I just finished my PhD at Carnegie University. And um, talking with Jose, actually, I think it was like the day after my defense. So I just wanted to be honest. And I think it was there like about 100 minutes or two days later. Jose sent me a message. And he was like, hey, now that you are certifiably fresh, like, you've completed. So like, could you give a talk at PLMW? Um, kind of, yes, like maybe I'd like to reflect on PhD. And how it went, and how things work, and things now. Um, so anyway, I, I thought it sounded like a great idea. And um, this particular talk um, is not so much about, say, like functional programming specifically, or it's not about um, a particular technical area, but it's much more about like the daily process of being a PhD student and the challenges that you face. And I think most of those challenges are a very personal kind of endeavor of figuring out how to structure your time in a meaningful way and how to um, work with um, the the challenge of doing research. I mean, research is, is challenging because kind of the normal state of being is being stuck on something. And that's not typical for other kinds of work that we do. So how do you how do you deal with that? Okay. So that's kind of what I'd like to talk about today. Um, little disclaimer, like there's really no right or wrong way to do any of this. And so I, I don't want to get up here and try to say like there's Here's what you have to do in order to be a successful PhD student or successful researcher. In general. That's not what I'm trying to say. I, I, I'd like to give you a list of things that you might like to try. If you find yourself struggling with some aspect of being a researcher, then it might be helpful to have a list of things that you know works for some of this. And so this is a list of things that works for me, some tips that works for me, and tips also that works for some of my friends who also have you know, graduated from college and found some success in their PhD journey. Um, so, like, if you meet your porn this way, that's fine. Um, if you meet it that way, that's fine too. Or like, hey, maybe you'll get some weird ideas of a completely different way of being porn today. And like, if you do, perfect, because uh, maybe the first two ways don't work for you, and the third way does. So, I don't this. Okay. <clears throat> um, the first thing I want to talk about is um, this transition that we all have to make from being, say, uh, an undergrad, and then transitioning into a graduate student. And this is a, tr a transition where you have to change the way that you approach learning, but also a transition where you have to change the way in which you, um, you do uh, work. Okay. Let me first talk about uh, learning. Okay, So when, when you're an undergrad, um, your life is consumed by taking classes. Like, you are taking as many classes um, only as many as is required. You, okay, probably, but like you're required to take many classes, right? And for good reason. Classes are really efficient way of learning something. You can learn many things very, very quickly. And as an undergrad, typically you're young and you have the energy to do so, right? Like you have the energy to spend like more than 40 hours a week on like doing hard problems, okay? And doing them constantly. And you get very used to that experience of uh, technical topics, experiencing technical topics through the lens of technical topics. But as you become, a, as you move on, and you become a graduate student, and, and um, you know, start like getting deeper and deeper into these topics, um, you run into some hurdles here. Okay, first is that classes become less and less available for the stuff that you need to learn. Right? And the reason for this is quite simple, really. You're getting to the point where nobody can teach you the stuff that you need to learn. You have to learn it for yourself. Okay? Or maybe there's really only like one person up in the world who can teach you the thing that you need to learn. So there's no incentive for that person to create a class for you. Because they're going to be the only person in the class. Right? And also, like maybe you could learn from that person by interacting with them one on one. And hopefully that person is maybe your advisor. Yeah. But that's not always the case. Right? So you need like a new way of like, learning things. Okay. There's a second aspect of, of this transition where classes when you are when you're young know, and <laughs> like, okay, I guess I'm still young in class, but like, <laughs> I don't feel it anymore. <laughs> um, uh, when you're young you have energy to like do classes like hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and like get something out of it. But I found, even by the time I was like, 
at a 25, 26. I just couldn't really do that anymore. It was just like not something my body was physically capable of doing anymore. And so I still had to shift and start thinking about classes as an investment rather than a necessity. Okay? Where, like, if you want to take a class, maybe you're required to take a class for your PhD program. You're probably required to take multiple classes. I really encourage you to see those classes as opportunities that you also need to weigh against like, the cost of them. And that cost is time and energy. Okay. And this is really just, maybe if there's a theme of this talk, it's that time and energy are a very scarce resource, despite the fact that your time is going to feel extremely constructive <laughs> during the PhD. So, um, I'd like you to be aware of the time and energy that you put into the projects that you're doing and also the classes that you're kind of at the beginning of your PhD um, There's another aspect of this transition away from learning based on classes, which is really, really important, which is to be aware of your personal reward system. So <clears throat> there's kind of two different, what I mean by personal reward system is like the dopamine that pops in your brain and then you like finish something and you're like, ah, I feel good, you know, about finishing something, right? Um, and when you're taking classes, um, this doesn't even necessarily mean like getting a good grade on something. It could mean literally just the relief of being done with it in a right? You finish an assignment, you submit it, who cares what grade you get on it? That's not, that's not here yet, right? But in that moment, like you feel this relief of, like, ah, I'm done with something. And I can go work on something else, or I can go play video games with it. So when, when you're an undergrad, like, okay, maybe you work hard on Monday, and then Tuesday, like, ah, you know, oh, I'm not going to relax anymore because I finished something. And then maybe you work a couple more days, and then, like, ah, another like, satisfying, I'm done with something, right? And this kind of continues, okay? Um, as you get into research, you might find that it starts to feel like this, right? Where the deadline is, like, six months away, or it's, like, a year away, Okay? And it feels like I'm stuck, I'm stuck, I'm stuck, I'm working, I'm working, I'm working. And that feels like it could go on for months. Right? And the question is, how do you manage that? How do you turn this into something which works for your personal reward system? Right? You've got to like, figure out a way of like, giving your body the dopamine that it needs. Right? And that's really challenging. And this is something that I struggled with as a, like, in my first year or two. And I found myself just working all the time because I was, I was seeking that reward. But was never able to get it. Right? So how to manage that? Actually, if it wasn't clear enough, you don't want this. But this is not helpful. If this is your experience in the research, this is not <clears throat> um, So we have to figure out a way of like measuring our daily progress and moving forward. Right? And like the, the question to ask is like, if the deadline is six months away, how do I measure this on a daily basis? So what is daily progress? Daily progress is not publishing a paper. It's not solving a problem. It's not even like proving a theorem or fixing a problem. I mean, as many of you hopefully already have become familiar, I mean, proving a theorem can take weeks, months. Fixing a book, a book can take weeks or months. So on the project I'm working on right now, so we're building a, a compiler and a team system as part of our research. And um, there's an open ticket on GitHub, and it's been open for it's a bug that's been open for months. And like, every once in a while, I'll sit down and try to fix it. It's a Heisen bug. Like, you run it like 100 times, and then finally on the 100th run, you like get a crash. And then you like hopefully have GDB open already. And you're like, OK, you, like, start stepping through things. And then GDB crashes because, you know, like it, you like ask it to run you know, like this thing, and it gets you a set for like, Oh, so okay, so anyway, so I tried to debug this thing a million times. I can't figure out what the problem is. So this is not daily progress, right? <laughs> like, or at least try, the goal of fixing this problem is not some sort of meaningful daily goal. So what is a meaningful measure of daily progress? Okay, the only one that I can possibly that has worked for me is is literally just thinking about time and energy. How much time and energy did I put into something? And this is a process of trusting yourself, trusting that the time and energy you're spending is valuable. Right? Even if it feels like you're stuck, that was still, you have to like believe that that time is valuable. Right? 
a simple example, right? I got, I got stuck in the proof yesterday. Today I spent X hours on it. I'm still stuck. Is this progress? Yes. 100% yes. This is progress, okay? And I, like, I can tell you this, but this is something that you just have to like, start to think about. You have to ask yourself, like, even though I'm still stuck, did I make progress? <clears throat> and you have to convince yourself that the answer is almost always yes. Don't get hyper focused on, I'm still stuck, I'm still stuck. I want you to, like, at the end of the day, reflect on the time that you spent and say, I, I spent four hours on this group today. Yeah, that counts. Right? And that's the thing that I hope rewards you at the end of the day. But at the end of the day, you sit down and you're like, you're done with work for today and you start laying on the couch or something. And you're asking, what did I do with my time today? And you might feel like you didn't do anything for time today. But actually, you did a lot. Right? <clears throat> One really good indicator for this is, is um, oh, well, let me, let me come back to that. Um, one really good indicator for this is whether or not you feel tired. Right? And this is in terms of like mental energy and like expenditure. Right? If at the end of the day you feel tired, that means you did work. So I found that if I felt tired at the end of the day, that was actually an opportunity for me to feel good about what I had done that day. That can sound bad because it's not like the goal is to be tired. Okay? Um, but I felt like this was a really good indicator for my personal habits of like whether or not I like did good work that day. I would be, I, I think today I'd be um, ready to relax. And that was a good indicator. Versus at the end of the day, if I felt anxious or something, that usually meant that like maybe I hadn't spent my time very well or something. But anyway, that's a very individual thing. It's something that you have to think about for yourself. Um, so, just going back to this thing about the deadline. So, um, if the deadline arrives and you're not done, wait, so the, the whole motivation for this discussion here is like this question of like, the deadline is like six months away. Right? And how to manage your time as you get close, as, <laughs> even if you're far away from the deadline, but also as you get close to the deadline. Okay. You can feel very um, uh, anxious about the deadline itself, knowing that the deadline is months away and you have no idea if you're going to get there. But also, maybe the deadline is just a few weeks away, and you don't know if you're going to get there. A big part of research is working on problems that you don't even know if the problem is solved. If you get to the deadline and you don't have a result, that's okay. That's a normal part of the process. Um, the deadlines are useful for kind of motivating yourself to sit down and do something. It's kind of like this artificial like, way of like, forcing yourself to get something. Um, which is actually extremely useful, right? Um, but the deadline is not the goal. The goal is like, solving the problem. It's, it's making some progress or gaining insight into some problem. Right? And it's very common, extremely, extremely common, to get to the deadline day and be like, eh, we don't have something. Whatever. We're not submitting this deadline day. And then you go for the next day, right? It's kind of like um, running. I, I like to run. Maybe some of you like to run as well. It's a good way of kind of being flushing your brain and kind of like, turning off your brain rather than saying so there's nothing to do with that. When, when I go for a run, I'm always like setting a goal. Like, you set a goal for the end of the street. But you get to the end of the street and you're like, I'm not that run. And then you set the next goal. And you like go to the end of the next street. And once you get there, you're like, oh, I'm not done yet either. And, like, and you keep setting the next goal, right? The research is, is very simple. You like you get to your, your deadline day, and you're like, oh, I'm not I'm not done. There's more to do. And, you, and then maybe you skip that deadline and you go to the next one. Okay, so um, uh, that was all about like how do you measure progress, right? The next question is how do you actually structure your hours? Right? Like you've got it, typical experience as a PhD student is the whole day is it's just like maybe you have a meeting in the middle, or like maybe you have like one class at the time or something. But otherwise, like, your typical experience is you know, my whole day is just going to be like, how do you structure that time to do a meaningful work? As uh, an early PhD student, like early in my kind of experience of doing research, I had no structure for this. And uh, later, I developed a structure that turned out to be so nice. 
like just a silly story that happens to you. Okay? Um, this was largely motivated actually by my roommate at the time, one of my undergrad friends. He went off and got a real job. And um, uh, he was like waking up at you know the same hour every day and coming home from work at the same hour every day. And um, it seems kind of nice. Like I was like observing my friend, you know, having a decent experience of his work, work life balance, right? And, and I was like, oh, shoot, I should figure this out. Okay. So, so here's, here's what I did. Okay, so uh, two, two categories maybe. Focus hours and working hours. Um, this is what works for me, is to kind of categorize things in this way. The focus hours are when you're like trying to not be distracted, you're like focusing really hard on something. And it's something intricate, something complex. So like a complex proof, or maybe you're doing something which is awful. Right? Um, maybe you're doing some some neat of a paper that you're working on. That's something where you kind of need to be a very um, detailed right? It's a tiring process, but it's also an essential process to do a technical work. Those are separate from the more general kind of like working hours. Where you just, there's all this other stuff you have to do. You've got to respond to meetings, you've got to schedule things, you've got to go to meetings. Meetings can be focused, but also meetings can be just like simple challenges. So I like to think about it as focus is very like constrained, targeted, it's it's narrow, right? It kind of has a little bit of overlap with, overlap with kind of general work, right? But in general, like, it's, it's sort of like a separate category. Um, what I found personally is that uh, when I wake up in the day, I make coffee, I eat breakfast, and then I do my focus hours. That's just what works for me. But it, it's different for everybody. Right? Maybe your focus hours, maybe you're night on, and your focus hours are like from 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. Like, if that works for you, great. Um, I would just encourage you to be aware of when your focus hours are. Right? And then ask yourself, is this working? And if it's not working, then, then try to put them somewhere else in your, in your day, daily schedule and just see how it is. So when, when I first started my PhD, I didn't really have this distinction. Or if I did have the distinction, it felt like my focus hours were jumping around. It's like one day I would focus really hard at 10 p.m. And then the next day I would focus really hard at 11 a.m. or something. And it was all over. It's completely uncontrollable. Right? And it was getting in the way of like just enjoying life. You know, like my friends would spontaneously, like, you know, want to go out to dinner or something. But I would be, like, ready to focus on a hard problem. And, like, totally flashed it, like, busy. Okay. And so by scheduling my focus hours for the morning, that seems to work. Right? And it seems to align with my friends' schedules. And it seems to align with things that I need in order to be happy. <laughs> right? That's the thing that's most important. You have to figure out how it fits in your schedule. Like, I was trying to hang out with my friend who had a nine five job. So this worked out. Okay, outside of work and focus, you actually still have a job. Like this is the goal. The goal outside of these hours is do not work on your stuff. Okay? Like this should be the goal. Have rest and have fun. Okay? And everything else is in service of that. Part of being able to rest at the end is feeling good about the work that you did. Okay. And so being able to, like, at the end of the day, say, like, uh, the, the plan is I'm going to play video games. Or the plan is uh, I'm going to sit down and do it or something. And then feeling good about accomplishing that goal, that's what it's about. Like being able to feel good about the rest of the time, that's, in some sense, the most important. Now, just one last thing that I'd encourage you to think about um, before you spend a lot of time with it. Like, I want you to ask yourself what that work is going to be for you. <clears throat> this is something that my advisor really helps me identify. Because I would show up to meetings and I'd be like, look at this cool idea. And he'd be like, that is pretty cool. It's like, but it's, but it's not this much. Yeah. Like, he, he would say, well, this isn't something published. And on reflection, I realized, like, oh, it was cool because it was new to me. Uh, it was like some sort of personal enrichment for me. 
where it left. It was like the first time that it went to this apple. Well, actually, the first time that humanity went into that apple was like you know, 50 years ago. Right? So, like, personal enrichment is valuable. It's extremely important. But it's not necessarily research. It's not necessarily something that's going to turn into something public. There's another kind of category of work, which I like to call just engineering. Okay? This is like that stupid GitHub ticket that's been open all this time on my project. That, like, it's this bug that I really would like to fix. But to be completely honest, it's not getting in the way of the research. You know? We have very good reason to believe that it's not um, invalidating our results. Right? It's like this silly housing bug that like, isn't really that a huge problem at the end of the day. But like, it'd be pretty nice to fix it. So that's like a just engineering kind of thing. Sometimes the just engineering can be in service of the research that we need to do. Right? So once again, like this project that I've been working on, developing the bioinformatics system, but there's a lot of engineering that we had to do just to make it possible to do the research that we need to do. Right? It was necessary to get a working system before we can start making changes to open experiments. That's a really difficult part of doing PL research in general. Um, okay, there's like a PL theory, which doesn't necessarily need an implementation to go along with it, but a lot of PL work comes along with the implementation. And that could be, for example, like, you know, like making this proof or something. That's the kind of implementation that, that, that people do in, in service of their, of their research. Right? And there's a lot of just engineering that goes into that. Okay? And it's a necessary work. But it's important to be aware of what category of work it is. So that you're not just like mindlessly working on some task without knowing exactly what the purpose of that task is. Just let me think. <clears throat> I found this distinction extremely because, especially because it started to get me thinking, what is going to be a contribution to the end of the day? That's the stuff which is like research. And it helps me develop that um, map. You know, Chris is talking about map. One of the things you have to figure out with a map is like, what are the frontier is. Like, what are the unexplored parts? Right? And you might currently, in your current journey, might actually be exploring things that are already well mapped by right? um, So asking yourself this question, like, am I at the frontier? Am I at the frontier? It's extremely helpful for eventually like, being able to self identify that like, this is research. Okay, well, I won't talk about projects. So, project budget. So, uh, as uh, you know, early in your research journey, maybe you kind of have only one project going, okay? and that's totally fine. But as you get further along, you'll find that you kind of like, accumulate projects, like more and more projects, and you're kind of becoming involved with more and more things. Okay? It can seem overwhelming, but actually, I'd like to encourage you to view it from positive points, but actually, it's extremely helpful. Okay? And even uh, early, in your in your research experience, um, I'd like to encourage you to think about taking on more projects. Okay. Two projects is really nice, okay. And part of the reason for this is that if you ever get stuck on one thing, you can work on another. Okay. Like I said earlier, the normal state of being is stuck. That's like usually where you are. Okay. So if you are stuck in one place, then hopefully you can. Let that rest. Okay. Come back to it later. Move on to something else. Try to make progress in something else. Um, so uh, I found in particular two projects as a really nice balance. One project where you're like the lead, you're like the person who's calling the shots, you're like uh, doing the hard work. And maybe another project on the side, which um, you're helping with. But it's not necessarily one which um, is consuming all of the time. That's a nice place to start. And then I think you'll find is, as you get more experience, this number just grows. <laughs> That's a separate thing to figure out. That's something I'm still figuring out. I'm, you know, I'm a postdoc now. And so if I have like three or four projects going on, so maybe five projects, you know, like that's now where I am, okay? And then like you would go ask my advisor, like, how many projects have you been going on? Like, it's just like 10, or, like, 15, or like, you know, like, it's just, it just grows. And it's, I guess, it's, a, it's a game of figuring out how to make So, um, just don't go for investing in one project. Because if you put all of your eggs in one basket, you might find, find out that the basket is a one bottom of it. And, like, uh, you don't want to, like, tie your 
entire uh, sense of self self worth to my single problem. I mean, you know, the entire self worth to the problems that we identify, but like, it's a common thing habit that we all have as academics. Um, so it's very nice when you discover that there's a hole in the bottom of your basket of X that you have like another basket of X that you can go right now. Okay. So just something to think about. Um, in order to be in service of like, this, this goal of like, doing multiple projects at once, I really encourage you to create environments where you can make incremental projects that are So one way of doing this is to have like some sort of running notes for each project. Um, this is something that only you're looking at, right? And every time you have an idea, you just like type it in. You know, right? um, or kind of a similar to a brain dump document. Uh, this is fantastic. I love the brain dump document. I have like, a huge brain dump in my Apple notes. It's got to be like hundreds of pages at this point. And um, every day, if I have some garbage that's like filled with brain, I, I have to I have to dump it somewhere. Right? If you keep it in your brain, It'll rot, it'll like take up all the space in there. It's like not helpful. Okay? Part of the reason why you're holding on to it in your head is because you're hoping that there's a diamond in there. Okay? But the only way to find a diamond is to like sift through it. And the only way to do that is to like get it out. You have to like get it out of your head and like onto a page. And probably you'll like never read it again. And that's part of the fun, actually, because then that means you don't have to care at all about what you're writing. You just like Start dumping stuff on page, and you feel good about the fact that it's sloppy as heck, that there's like no flow, that it's completely stream of consciousness, right? But then sometimes you wake up and say, like, "Oh wait, there was like an idea that I can like work, and I can I can extract <laughs> from that." And like, well, but like usually you never come back and look at it, which is great. Just make a book, like. If you, if you like feel like a project is starting, like just make create a place where you can start building something. Right? That could be like a lot of document that you just like make the lot of document and start working on it. Right? Or it could be like if you're working on some code, like just make the Google code and start working on it. Right? Um, so like I have my like private like miscellaneous stuff in code, you know, that I've been building for I hope those are years, so 2017. I actually think there's another folder in here called Old, um, which probably goes back to 2012. Um, this is one of the favorite repos that I've ever made. Okay? Because after I made this repo, I suddenly had a place to put um, uh, the diamonds. Like, okay, I got a brain dump document. I just like, dump on my crap and don't worry about it. Okay? But every once in a while, I found something that's interesting that felt like it was worth remembering. And now I have a place to put that. But still, there's not instruction. It's literally just like uh, what year I like, came up with the idea, and like a subfolder that like, maybe will help me remember what I have in the end. Yeah, that's it. Great. Okay, you also should uh, create a place where you can um, do this uh, with your collaborators. Right? So, like, we have um, these names are unfeasible. Um, but um, uh, we, we have a draft repo. Um, with, like my, with my collaborators, so it's a private repo, like only we're looking at it, okay? But this is where we dump all of our uh, LaTeX stuff that eventually, hopefully, becomes a paper, right? Um, but a lot of these never become a paper, okay? And that's part of the process, okay? But like, it's so essential to have this because you can start actually putting the ideas into a form that maybe is close to what they form would be. Um, so, let's see. So, type this into that's my. Co-worker Justin, and I guess he was working on Jenkins factor or something. It's two days ago. Here we go. Yeah. No, I don't actually remember this stuff. I, I changed those names. Um, okay, this is going to feel very chaotic, but like you got to embrace the chaos. Right? Like you're you're going to go from feeling organized in your life to feeling disorganized in your life, and uh, I at first found that very uncomfortable, but actually I started to find it fun. Um, and like, I hope that you find it fun too, where like you are sitting down one day and you're like, oh, what's that idea that I like vaguely remember thinking about four months ago, and like, what did I, where did I write that down, and like you're not really sure. It's okay if you're not sure when you wrote it down. 
Sometimes if you have to recreate from scratch, you're going to recreate it better the second time around, right? So like, mm -hmm. if the, this process is chaotic, of just like, putting your ideas down in various places or whatever, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and that's part of the fun, right? So and I hope you are able to discover some fun in this process as well. I, I have not found this process fun, but it took a while. Um, a little bit of change of pace here, but uh, one of the most difficult things that I worked through I'm still working on, is uh, managing my own profession. This is a common trait in academia. I'm sure many of you probably feel like you might be some of the perfectionist yourself. Um, at the very least, I think many of you probably have had the experience of imposter syndrome, which is very close to the uh, to perfectionism. Um, and how, how do I deal with this in a bit more? Okay, so let me give you a little story here. Um, this is like four years ago or something, five years ago. Um, it was like the week before the party, and I was not feeling good about the work that I was doing at that time. I was, I, I was doing experiments for a paper that we were going to submit, and I, like, one day I woke up and I was just like, ah, oh, this is not good, and like, uh, we're doing it all wrong, and like, blah, blah, blah. And I went into my advisor's office and I was like, <laughs> very flustered. And he was like, whoa, whoa, sit down. I'm like, hold on, let's talk about this. Okay. And he's like, what's the problem? I said, like, okay, um, I was like, I've been reading all these other papers and they do it completely differently than we do. And, and they have really good justification for the way that they do it. And, uh, and uh, so, and he was like, okay, well, like, you did it differently, right? I was like, yeah, I did it differently. Right? He was like, what's wrong with the way you do it? And I was like, I'm not sure, but it's not the way that they do it. Right? And, and he was like, this is, there's no problem. He's like, you did it the way that you did it. And you did it in a way that seemed like the right way to do it. Even though you weren't necessarily familiar at the time with the way that you did it. And he said, so all you have to do, he's like, the deadline's a week away. Can't change anything now. <laughs> he's like, all you have to do is just write what you did. Be clear, be honest. If you have a justification for it, write it. If you don't have a justification for it, not what you do. Just at least describe what you did. Be a good scientist and describe what you did. Describe your method. And then we'll get reviews and we'll see where, we'll see where we are. Mm -hmm. And he's like, hmm, just, you know, it's okay. It's okay. Mm -hmm. So, what I was dealing with was some issue of perfectionism. I felt like I, need, I was worried that my work was going to be judged by other people. And I was worried about being able to defend myself. And, <clears throat> Okay. On the one hand, perfectionism can be actually really useful. Because it can be really helpful to get work done. Um, it can be rewarding because after you get good work done and you feel pride in your good work, okay, that's a very rewarding experience. But also it can be extremely unhealthy because you could can uh, you might be imposing uh, unrealistic, expect unrealistic expectations on yourself. Okay? And even worse than that, it can be toxic in the sense of imposing unrealistic expectations on others. It's okay to make mistakes. This is like, this is the number one, like, most important thing in when doing research. If you don't have to be an expert on day one, you don't have to get everything right on day one, okay? And uh, making mistakes is a huge part of the process, and um, I would encourage you to be aware of the mistakes that other people are making. Not for the goal of putting them down, please don't do that. But for the goal of noticing that we're all just people. You know, everybody makes mistakes and it's not a big deal. Um, I used to stress over the typos that I might have in the papers. Like on the day of the deadline, the paper's done, and it's like 1 a.m. Like, okay, it's time to submit, you know, go to bed. Right? But I would like be proofreading, 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 like, so scared of there being a typo in this And I don't know when this changed. I don't know, maybe it was when I got, like, I was doing some emails with like, a prominent researcher and their emails were filled with typos. Like, no proper punctuation, like, statements ending in question marks, and questions ending in, in periods, and, and, and like, no capital letters anywhere. And I was, and I really, and I was like, 
this is, this is a cool person. This is like somebody I was really excited to interact with. You know? And I got that email and I was like, oh wow, this doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You know? So now when I'm reading papers, like, you'll see in, in everyone's you know, papers that they write, you'll see people make titles. You know? You'll see the B, B, you'll see like, misspelled things, you'll see hyphens when you like, um, I get a warm fuzzy feeling for this. Thing. I don't know. When I see a typo, I'm like, this is, I love this person. You know? Because like, I'm like, I can see them, like, they're working on something. It's, they're, you know, they're tired. They're like, trying to put their ideas in the page, right? In the cell, I'm like, who cares? It's like, it doesn't matter, right? If it gets to the point where the paper is kind of real, that's a different question, right? You know? It's, <laughs> if, you, if you literally like, don't know what they're saying, because they have written it well. That's a different question. The huge thing with the it's not a good thing. And I, I don't be worried about it if you can type it yourself. It's not a huge thing. And if you get reviews back for a paper and somebody says, like, oh, I didn't understand this, right? And you go back and you're like, oh, it's because there's a typo in there. Like, very simple response. Sorry. We made a mistake. We made a mistake. No. Um, the other aspect of uh, perfectionism, which I found at first, was uh, being worried that I wouldn't be able to defend it. I was worried that I would get a question that I didn't know how to answer. So this is kind of like maybe like a social anxiety thing, but it's also more generally like this worry of like, we, if you want to come across as intelligent, you want to come across as smart, you want to come across as an expert in the field. But like, well, if you weren't an expert, that's fine, okay? So the question is, like, how do you deal with the situation where you like, don't know how to do it? Somebody asks you, somebody gives you a criticism and asks you, what do you think about this? And you honestly don't know. Okay? It can be helpful to practice uh, some responses in, for those situations. Okay? And um, what I found is a really useful kind of rule of thumb is to just describe your experience and where you are. Okay. Like, you just need to be honest about your current understanding of the problem, and also, like, be honest about what you try to have with these responses, right? So, like, a really nice response is just, oh, I'm familiar with that. You know, I haven't looked into it yet, but I think so. Or, um, maybe they ask you about something you are really kind of pretty familiar with, but you, like, haven't, you still don't want to answer the question, right? Well, then you can say, like, look, I've actually, I've thought about that very thing, well, like, I got stuck on this. And, you, know, you can tell the person, like, here's where I got stuck. Right? So you're not trying to answer the question in a technical sense. You're trying to answer the question in a like personal sense of, like, here's what I've tried. Right? <clears throat> um, or you can just, do, uh, very simply, you can just say, sorry, I actually am not familiar with this thing you're asking me about. And um, hopefully you're interested in learning more. And you can say, like, maybe you can tell me about it later. Or you can send this in. So these sorts of responses, I'd encourage you to um, imagine yourself in those situations, so like somebody asking you about your work and you not know how to answer. Um, imagine yourself giving one of these responses. Okay? And I'd encourage you to try to get to the point where it feels comfortable giving these sorts of responses. To okay? Because I think you'll find that um, as you get more and more into research, um, you'll find that you are aware that you know these things. Like you accumulate this huge bag of like things that you know you don't know. Right? And it's very nice to be able to like talk to somebody and be like, oh, that's a cool thing. I put my bag of stuff in there. Oh, and you're, oh, thanks for that like uh, you know, comments about my work. This could actually help me work. I put it in a bag of things that I don't know. <laughs> you know. And then like later you take the things out of your bag and you know, and you try to pick them apart and figure out what's important for you. Um, being confident in giving these sorts of responses to questions really comes from a place of confidence in your own journey. Okay? Where you might not be an expert in the paper that you're giving to talk about, in the sense that like, maybe it's your first paper. Um, you're not an expert yet. We're close to being an expert then, but like you don't know what right? That's your journey at that moment, right? So if somebody asks you something, you don't know how to answer it. 
I have confidence in my own journey. Yeah. And you're saying, like, yeah, I haven't gotten that. I'm not familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Another change of pace here. Um, I'd like to give you a few writing tips um, that I have found immensely. This is like one of the single pieces of advice that has stuck with me about writing that I keep coming back to. Um, which is, uh, nobody reads, there's no right way to read. Okay. This is a really helpful to keep in mind when you are trying to communicate your work to other people. Okay. Because you might expect people to read your book a certain way, like maybe from the front to back. Okay. But like, nobody does that. Okay. So, like, read their ad. You know, maybe they just stand up. Right? They just like, quickly read that from the look through and they like, read like, the first sentence of each. Section or something, and then they take a look at the stuff. That's a nice thing like that. You know, and then they put the paper down. That's one way to read a paper. Mm -hmm. Another way is uh, you know, somebody reads an introduction, you know, it seems pretty interesting, jumps to a conclusion, yeah, they've got good results. Okay. You know, done. <clears throat> Another way somebody might read the paper is um, they will actually read it in depth, but completely out of it. Right? So, like, you know, maybe they'll start here. And then like, I'll go read the conclusion. Yeah. And then they'll go look at my experiments and be like, oh, I don't really understand what this one thing. Maybe they explained it earlier. Oh, yeah, they did explain it earlier. Oh, now I get it. You know, like, this kind of thing. Like, that's a very typical way that people read papers. Right? So when you're writing a paper, how do you navigate this? Right? Oh, that's, here's another way people might read papers. It's actually very uncommon. People don't really read papers from the back. But occasionally they do. And actually, maybe you are some of the people that might read papers from the back. This is something that, that I know that I did when I was first starting out reading papers. And actually, extremely nice way to read it. Because right? you know, probably the, the author is somewhat intended for the people who read it. You know, right? <laughs> so this is not to say that like, this is a crazy way to read a paper. Actually, it's a great way to read a paper. It's just extremely uncommon. The, the experts don't read papers this way, okay? But um, it's another type of way, it's another way to do it. So how do you navigate that? Okay, so the goal is you have to give all of your readers something to keep them going. You know, no matter what order your paper is read in, there always needs to be some sort of like way that somebody can navigate it. Okay? I don't have a definitive, like, this is not for right? But I, I don't have a definitive list of like, these are the techniques to make this happen, right? But I'd like to encourage you to at least be aware of this when you're writing a paper. And when you're writing uh, a section, ask yourself, what if this is the first thing that somebody reads? Are they going to be completely lost? Or do they have breadcrumbs that they can um, go grab and they can follow the breadcrumbs and they can get to where they need to go? And this can be as simple as saying, like, you know, putting, just starting with a little bit of context. You can always, like, you know, at the beginning of a section, you can say, like, <clears throat> as we developed in this section, we now build on that, blah, 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 blah. So that's the breadcrumb that's going to follow, right, if they lost. Um, or you can say, like, um, you know, uh, put your internal references in the paper, you know, call back to different parts of the paper to help people navigate through the paper if they jump through the same thing. This is by far the most useful piece of advice I've ever had in my And it's, it's honestly probably the only thing I think about when I'm writing. Outside of like making sure that I'm presenting this accurately and well and, and, and everything, but like, this is always the question I'm asking. It's like, what if somebody starts reading here without any other knowledge? Right? And um, I think it's going to be really much better. So I encourage you to try this. Okay. Uh, so that's a big grab bag of um, random tips and pieces of advice that have worked really well for me in my PhD, and I've observed the work for other people at the um, So I hope it was helpful for you. Once again, um, none of this is, here's what you have to do. This is like a big list of like, here's what you might try. If you feel like you um, need to try something, like maybe something is not you need to try something, you can try something. So, okay. mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you. Thank you.